This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. It is the first night of the NBA play-in tournament for 2023. We've got the Hawks and the Heat, the Wolves and the Lakers. We're going to break down both those games with Brandon Gadula for today, getting his read on those games from a betting perspective and get you set for this week's PGA Tour event, the RBC Heritage. Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire, joined here as mentioned by Brandon Gadula. He is a senior managing editor of numberfire.com. Brandon talked about this yesterday on the show and recapping last week, but John Rom, a winner for you at plus 950. So uh congratulations on that. How you doing today? I'm good. Uh yeah, Rom was the guy who uh, just showed some value. It was boy, I'll, I'll say this much. I was really hope uh, really rooting for him for uh multiple reasons. Um <laughs> I did so like not three want three or four see... reasons inside the top five, potentially. Hypothetically. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, uh, it was, it was interesting to see Brooks cap go back. It was obviously fascinating to see Phil Mickelson play the way that he did on Sunday, but yeah. Um, Rom had that look in his eye. I think he, yeah. he wanted to make a statement and he, he sure did. He was two to one between the third and fourth round on Sunday. Uh, Data Golf had him at 37%. So I did take him at, at two to one, not quite 950, but uh, mm-hmm. happy about it regardless. But like you said, he kind of used playing well. That's one, um, of the be- that's one of the best things about like a favorite is, yeah, that's sure, like mathematically and just practically, that, that is a huge difference. But it's also kind of like not. You know, if if he's if he's in contention, you can maybe up that unit and kind of get the same return as you would on a single unit. It's not perfect, but yeah, yeah, if you missed out on Rom, hopefully you you caught him uh, during the tournament. It is weird, though, because like. I feel a lot different about hitting a two to one golf bet than I do about like a two to one baseball money line. Um, Like if I hit a 200 baseball money line, I'm losing my mind. If I lose a 200 uh, like outright for golf. I'm like, ah, oh, man, bad bet. Terrible. Like, what was I thinking? Like moron 33% implied odds to win you idiot. Uh, so different sentiment there, but Rom back in the field. Once again, this week, we'll talk about that later on, but first we'll start things off with the NBA play in tournament to get you ready for both of tonight's game. But first a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to covering the spread, wherever you get your podcast. We got some more NBA talk tomorrow, along with NFL draft discussion via Dr. Ed Feng. We'll have some more baseball coming up this week. I'll talk some NASCAR. I'm sure at some point, uh, shocker there, uh, more NBA discussion, plenty of good stuff. All right here. In the number fire, uh, the covering the spread podcast feed, only one slip up on which podcast I'm talking about so far for this week. Find covering the spread wherever you get your podcasts and over on the FanDuel YouTube page. The NBA playoffs are here. You can turn crossovers into cash with FanDuel. Just visit FanDuel right now and place a five dollar bet. You'll get instant 150 bucks in bonus bets. Win or lose. There is no better place to bet all the playoff action than America's number one sports book. Just go to FanDuel and sign up to get 150 bucks in bonus bets when you place your first $5 bet. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG. Hope is here at GamblingHelplineMA.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts. In New York, 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text OPEN-Y. Must be 21 plus and present in select states. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. Bonus issued is non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See full terms at FanDuel.com slash sportsbook. 1-800-270-7117. What state is that? Where did I skip to? I have no idea what state I just read. Anyway, uh, let's go back to Arizona. 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342. In Connecticut, 1-888-789-7777. Over the ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. In Wyoming and Kansas, 1-800-522-4700 in Kansas, ksgamblinghelp.com. Louisiana is 1-877-770-STOP. In Maryland, mdgamblinghelp.org. In New in West Virginia, 
1-800-GAMBLER.net. They changed the order of the states and it's totally messed up my flow. So it's it's on me. Um, hashtag no excuses. Uh, but I, I've, I'm not playing like a champion today. So there we go. Messed up the name of the podcast. Messed up the states. So let's talk now about some NBA. The playoff, play-in tournament. Playoff, play-in, whatever. Oh my gosh. Play-in tournament begins today in the NBA. Let's talk about both those games here in just one second. Brandon, let's start things off here by talking about the broad adjustments you're making for the playoffs. We do see differences between the regular season and the playoffs. So from a handicapping perspective on your end, what adjustments are you making as we get the play-in games underway tonight? Yeah, so honestly, uh, I'll go away from a model a bit more um, for a few reasons. One you know, teams shorten their benches. And so the the types of samples we get over a full season on a per game basis are going to be a little bit different than what we get in the playoffs where starters are playing elevated minutes, therefore fewer, uh, fewer rotations, fewer uh, possessions from reserve level players. So it, it does become a little bit harder uh, in that regard. That's not to say that I won't lean on my model because I definitely will. And I do already exclude low leverage possessions. Credit to uh, pvpstats.com there for, for that data. Uh, again, great resource if you want to look at on-off splits in a little bit more detail, um, You know, accounting for like leverage on possessions, maybe who's who's playing in a game or who's off the court. You know, Because sometimes for some of these teams that we're going to talk about, uh, it's hard to find like a large sample that we want to trust for uh, tonight's game. But uh, you know, we'll get there. Uh, once we start breaking down those games, but honestly, for me, I will, you know, I think the, I think the best part about playoff basketball is like you see you see a series unfold, you see matchups, you see the way that teams adjust. And frankly, um, look, I I use my models for for everything for golf, basketball, just everything. But basketball is the sport that I know best mm-hmm. from a you know a viewing standpoint. I played it the most. I, I just know it most. And so uh, I'm not saying it's a, a necessarily a positive, but I do kind of uh, use a little bit of my personal knowledge and assumptions uh, to kind of impact things. So that doesn't help, you know, people listening necessarily, but sure. I do think that it's um, a situation where, you know, you're, you're going to be looking at uh, samples of teams playing against different teams and then trying to put that into how they're playing against a specific team over a seven game series. But, you know, as far as the data goes, I think there's another uh, tweak that we have to be aware of Um, since 2016. And if you exclude the the COVID season, home teams play better uh, in the playoffs than in the the regular season, In the regular season, a 57.3% win rate uh, average point differential of 2.3 cover rate of exactly 50% Um, in the playoffs. That's up to 61 and a half percent win rate. Average point differential of 4.7 points, cover rate of almost 52%. Uh, I know citing cover rates is a bit tricky because in a perfect world, well, I guess in in, an, in a perfect world for us. Um, <laughs> there are no know, adjustments. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it, it is what it is. And uh, you know, we also kind of see that we see an impact in terms of over-unders. In the regular season, there fifty point one percent over rate, but in the playoffs, forty seven point three percent. And a reason for that is the the league wide pace ticks down. Uh, the league average pace last season in the regular season was ninety eight point two uh, possessions per game. It was down to ninety five and a half in the playoffs. Uh, even you know, even if you just exclude the, because a lot of like bad teams play up tempo and that kind of skews things, but. Um, just the playoff teams themselves average 97.9 possessions in the regular season and then again down. So like we're, we're looking at like a two and a half ish percent pace decrease across the past few years. So pace is down. It takes out a few possessions here and there for each team. Um, and, you know, if you just kind of have ever watched NBA playoff basketball, you know, things slow down, keeps things a little bit tighter generally but blowouts definitely exist whenever teams are lopsided. So I would say the biggest adjustments for me are um, if I don't have a good read, kind of lean on the home team to kind of bring it. Um, but also, uh, you know, no one loves watching unders that, that, that they bet, but uh, I think that's 
generally the way that I go as well. Yeah. I had a Patrick Corbin under last night and like it was right around my bedtime because I'm old and I was like just refreshing, like please pull him, please pull him, please pull him. They did. It was good. Um, Mm -hmm. but like hundred percent relate to that. Now you mentioned the possession change, the pace change. You said that you don't lean as much on your model in the postseason as other times, but that's something you can't account for within the model. So when you are running your model for these games, are you baking in reduced pace, kind of an assumption for these teams? Yeah, I scaled back pace. Um, so I, I use the same process where I pull up, uh, you know, account for injuries and, and basically health, right? Like, you know, you don't want to look at the Lakers full season splits. They're a different team. Whenever they have LeBron, whenever they have Anthony Davis, they also obviously made some some trades tonight, like Minnesota is going to be a bit shorthanded. So, you know, all that's the same, uh, but I do factor in an expected uh, decrease in pace and a very slight uptick uh, with home court. I don't want to kind of get too aggressive there. Um, but yeah, it, it is factored in. And so while I said I don't lean on the model as much, I still am going to use it. Uh, but there's like a 5 to 10% you know, I'll say I test here sure. uh, just because I, you know, I want to take out all of the emotion when it comes to this, but I can't help but think sometimes I can uh, figure out how things are going to trend uh, and how teams might adjust as, as series unfold. It doesn't really apply for tonight's uh, matchups sure. necessarily, uh, but yeah, as, as series unfold, I kind of let my my thoughts creep in a little bit more. And I do think in an ideal world, that's how we do things as betters. If we feel good enough about our eye test abilities, I think that that is an important thing to factor in. Um, I'm a very much numbers-based guy too, but I realize there is value in an eye test. Um, like, I, I've i watched the Bristol Dirt Races. I'm not betting Kevin Harvick to win uh, based on watching those. Even my model shows value. So I think in an ideal world, we're filtering in both. And I think that it's nice that you have enough confidence there to do that too so let's talk about tonight's games we've got uh the heat and the hawks first right now the heat are five point favorites at FanDuel sportsbook total here is 228 and a half brandon let's start things off with this one where are you seeing value here at FanDuel? yeah so the heat uh, and again this is one of those spots in the playoffs you can look at like regular season series and see if that's something that you want to factor in i really don't but you know while i'm here the heat did win uh, three of the four games they played twice in March. Um, Miami won both of those, but all these games were within eight points. Three of them were exactly an eight-point differential. Uh, the most recent game was a two-point win uh, for Miami. If you look at the Heat with Jimmy Butler, the thirty-five and twenty-nine, but an adjusted point differential, which is just my own metric for how I adjust for teams of of uh, point nine. So not even a full point there, uh, but that's definitely something that. Uh, like we got to factor in for the heat and then for the Hawks, there are all the memes and all the jokes that they are super average. And that, that is the case. Like uh, it's, it's funny how much of their uh, splits, how much they hover 500 is just accurate. But in games with Trey young, Clint Capella and DeJounte Murray, a uh, 30 and 25 adjusted point differential of 0.8. Um, so a little bit better there. Uh, it's something that again, you kind of want to factor in. So, that being said, both teams are pretty average, and I know that we talked about home court advantage, but how much is that going to matter? Um, I don't in my model. I don't see it mattering enough to want to go with the Heat to cover uh, because the Heat have been playing really slowly, not a whole lot of points, despite the fact that the total is two twenty eight and a half. Um, so I think this game is a, a sort of slower, low scoring game, which makes it easier uh, for you know, just to take the points uh, for the Hawks. So for me, I I am on the Hawks plus five as well as the under. I don't know why that's going up, frankly, but I think it's probably got a lot to do with the fact that people love to bet overs. And these are pretty public games too, given they are the, the standalone NBA games for the night. There were no NBA games to bet on yesterday. So there's a lot of public attention on these for sure. And that can lead to, potentially less efficient markets i know they're the more money that is in a market typically the sharper it is but during nfl playoffs and stuff like that we talked to john shear in a fanduel sports book and he said you'll often see less efficient lines in play playoff games because there's more public money in the market that can influence things play a more outsized role there uh so 228 and a half the total right now under is minus 110 
I'm guessing you feel better about that than the Hawks plus five, correct? So it's one of those where like historically, like the seven seeds have won these games. Um, but for me, I think that these two teams have played pretty close in, in the past. And I think that the, the fact that Atlanta is pretty healthy, um, I'm kind of up on them right now just to keep it close. And I, I just sort of feel like it's going to be the type of game where it's not really, we're not really sweating the over under. I hate to say that kind of stuff, but I yeah. feel like it's going to be super low scoring. And then in, in that regard, I, I always have a hard time uh, not taking the points when I think it could be really close and low scoring. Yeah, you can. And those two things are correlated. Fewer points means less or lower odds to cover a larger spread, which five is decently large. Uh, you can same game parlay them. Uh, it's plus two, 248. So FanDuel is privy to the fact that those two things are correlated, uh, getting plus 240 with those two combined at minus 110 apiece. Uh, but you can play that way if you decide you want to. I'm not typically a parlay person, as we've discussed here on the show, but you have that option. If you decide you really feel good about both those ankles uh, for the Hawks and the Heat. Let's discuss the second game now. That is the Wolves at the Lakers. A lot of moving pieces here for the Wolves. No Rudy Gobert due to a suspension. Uh, Jaden McDaniels has a broken hand. Uh, fighting a wall typically does not go well for the fight E. Right now, the spread is eight and a half. That is lengthened quite a bit. I think it opened at like five or so. So it's it's lengthened quite a bit. Total in this game is 233. What do you see in this one, Brandon? Yeah, and... uh in defense of uh, McDaniels, I think he was trying to fight like a plastic curtain and there was really? a wall behind it. I think that's oh. the report that I saw. So, I mean, the plastic curtain also is not going to put up a huge fight. So that that's a little lopsided. He went from, you know, a lopsided fight to one that he's not going to win. Lopsided yeah. the wrong way. But yeah, this, this, you know, there's a lot of movement here. The, the over under is going up a lot. Uh, the spread is widening primarily due to the fact of uh, Minnesota's absences, but also for the Lakers, LeBron James, Anthony Davis, D'Angelo Russell, all listed as probable uh, going back to Minnesota. It's hard to find a good sample for them. One that has, you know, uh, enough possessions to feel really good with. You can, you can kind of make it work, but you know, Carl Anthony Towns has missed a lot of time. Uh, added Mike Conley, Gobert as, as out. Um, so it's it's a bit tough, but the splits that I have sort of settled on have them as about a league average team. And then for the Lakers, like, again, they have that trio healthy and not a whole ton of, of sample uh, in terms of, you know, this trio being together. But they're seven and one in games that they've played together. Uh, raw point differential of uh, over 12. You like to see that. Um, so factoring that in, I'm. I'm with uh, clearly the 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 public uh, on the Lakers. I don't really see how they don't win this game. The problem is the spread has is is climbing uh, to a degree that makes me a little bit uncomfortable. I do have the Lakers favored by double digits, so I'm still fine with eight and a half. Um, seven and a half was was where I initially saw it. Um, but again, I think the better play here is the under. Once again, I don't. You know, we might be playing in the angle of, oh, Rudy's out, therefore their defense is bad. But even with him out, it's not been that bad over the sample that, that I can kind of pinpoint as the best one to use. So above average defense there, same thing for the, the Lakers especially. So uh, including the pace decrease, you know, expectations. I have the under here. Uh, if I'm betting the spread, I still, I still think the Lakers uh, minus eight and a half works. If you're a money line person, I really like the the Lakers money line. But um, yeah, I, I just uh, I hope we can get this before it gets up because this one might this, this spread might even might even grow. Yeah, it, as you mentioned, seven yesterday when I sent you the rundown, yeah. it's now eight and a half. Uh, you told me to take it when it was seven, so luckily I did there. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Uh, total at two thirty three, and it sounds like. You want both unders here, and you could that situation where parlays are not bad bets if both bets are good individually, or if there's a tie between them. And if you think there's a tie between them where the pace lends itself towards unders, I think there is a consideration you made for potentially tying those together. Um, plus 264, the part if you were to parlay both of the unders for these two games across tonight, but 
I think in a situation where even if it was going up, you can have a decent amount of confidence in what your model is saying and feel confident in the under, despite, uh, you know, betting against the market is usually bad. But I think in this situation, the logic that you have is good, which is why I personally am willing to trust it myself. Look, everything comes down to, for me, can I be logical about it? I'm probably logical to a fault where sometimes I, I miss out on things that I feel like I have a good grasp on. Um, so I'm going to try to get a little bit more open in the NBA playoffs and, and trust myself a little bit more. But yeah, yeah I think it just is, again, we'll use that word logical to generally, not not exclusively, not just that, you know, but generally uh, target unders in the playoffs. Yeah. So again, um, under 233 is where Brandon likes that. Under 228 and a half at the first game, Hawks plus five potentially there. And then also the Lakers money line minus 375 at FanDuel Sportsbook right now. That's going to conclude our NBA discussion for today. We'll have more NBA discussion tomorrow here on the show with Dr. Ed Fang. We'll talk more about the play-in games and the playoffs as things roll along. For right now, though, let's talk about some golf. We had some fun with Augusta last week, and this week it's another elevated field for the RBC Heritage. Brandon, there at Harbortown Golf Links. What should we know about this course before placing our bets over at FanDuel? Yeah, to keep it simple, uh, it, it's about as opposite of a week-to-week switch as we can get uh coming from augusta which is long and demanding off the tee harbor town is pretty much the complete opposite uh strokes gained off the tee has a weaker than usual correlation with strokes gained total uh, but we see an uptick in the importance of iron play and wedge play putting is about average so more or less uh last week we gave um a bit of a lean toward golfers who hit it far off the tee you know mm-hmm. we talked to we talked, you know, why that wasn't the only stat that mattered. But this week, off the tee play doesn't matter a ton. This one's more about uh, your approach play, your around the green play, and your putting. Uh, you just can't really overpower the place. And so what that does is puts a lot of golfers who are short hitters in the conversation. That does not mean that golfers who hit it far off the tee are bad plays or get discounted a lot. Yes, some of their advantage is mitigated, but they're still hitting shorter clubs into greens from, uh, you know, because of how far they hit their clubs relative to a shorter hitter, like that still translates over. Uh, but these greens are tiny, uh, second smallest on average, um, compare only Pebble beach has smaller greens. So you're going to miss greens. You're going to have to get up and down. You're gonna have to save par whenever you can. So this is kind of listed as like the the perfect remedy for the distance problem in golf. And I think there is a distance problem in golf, but this course specifically, like it's a good all around test and it's not just about driver. So a lot of guys in play uh, for this week as a result. Yeah. And hitting a small green is easier if you're closer to it. So the distance can still help, but I think that the overall takeaway of more guys are in play is important. And that does play into the betting markets here as we see uh, both uh, John Robbins, Scotty Scheffler, plus 850 to win the event right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. And with no Rory, you'd think that'd be shorter. But with more guys in play, that does make a lot of sense. Looking at the outrights, Brandon, uh, here for the RPC Heritage, any value you see right now based on your numbers? Yeah, more guys in play, but also Rom specifically. Um, he's going to have to get right back on it after winning the I'm Masters. I'm sure that's and- super simple to brush off winning your second major and putting that green jacket on and stuff like that. And for him, I mean, it was such a like a whirlwind uh, with with all the the history of you know his heroes from Spain winning mm-hmm. uh, the Masters. So I, I you know, I'm not going to get there uh, with Rom specifically this week. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, otherwise, I'm looking a little bit down the list. Uh, long shots are in play to a degree, but for me, I kind of I'm noticing a few names who haven't necessarily won. Well. Two guys have won kind of recently, but uh, the the thing I love about the model that I that I use is just it reminds me of who's good and just maybe who hasn't won, and therefore where the odds are longer than they should be. But for me, Xander Schauffele, twenty five to one, uh, a name that I mention a lot. But T ten at Augusta last week, while having a pretty neutral putter, was fourth in T to green play last week, fifth in approach specifically. He's nineteenth in putting over the past fifty rounds. He's third over the past fifty rounds according to Data Golf. And strokes gained approach through putting. So really good fit uh, for Xander. Um, and I think he's just kind of, he's going to be lingering as always. Uh, so I, I like Xander at, at 25 to one. 
Also a name that doesn't sound like a course fit based on the fact that I said like driver is not super vital, but Tony Finau, 27 to one. He is fourth in approach through putting over the past 50 rounds. So if you take driver, which is one of his biggest strengths out of the equation, he is fourth in the field in just, you know, irons, wedges and, and putter, which is, is super, uh, super sick. And it's another situation where like the odds are getting longer on Tony because he just hasn't won super recently. Those are, those are the exact kind of situations that um, my model is designated more or less to remind me that these guys yeah. are uh, very good and not just chase the high end, super high end finishes. And for Fino, he's been like living around T20. That's good form. He can break through. And then the third guy I'm targeting, it's kind of a coin flip between Max Homa at 29 and Tom Kim at 37. I'm going to go Tom Kim because the odds are better, but yeah. really like Homa. Talk more about him in a second, but Tom Kim, great course fit, extremely accurate off the tee, great irons when he's on, and you know didn't really see him in coverage uh, last week. But T sixteen, he's at good, Augusta, yeah. T sixteen at Augusta last week, gaining an approach. That was his first uh, trip there, so yeah. uh, good performance for a debutante. This will be his first trip to Harbor Town, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but it's not it's not quite the same uh, level of of dauntingness there uh, to learn this course. But yeah, should hit a lot of fairways and then be in great position to, you know, gain a lot of greens on the field because he is that precise. So I think Tom Kim at 37 to one, another name that just probably would be long or sorry, would be shorter if he had like more top tens, top fives. But right. I think that there's a lot to like about Tom Kim for this week. And Tom Kim longer term is I had a lot of those, but I think we're seeing him get back to showing the top end form last week in a in a good showing at augusta is really intriguing because he had a bit of a lull leading into augusta um but 37 to 1 a good number on him other ones you mentioned tony finau 27 and xander shafle at 25 to 1 what about the non outrights the menu here not quite as expansive as we get for like the masters but still a good number of options uh any non outrights you like for this week yeah just some finishing positions uh i mentioned max homa the top 10 is he is he plus 360 um, he is plus 360. Yeah, plus 360. Eight. I have that as a good number. Uh, I mentioned like Finau being top four in strokes gain approach around the green and putting combined. Home is third. Mm -hmm. Home is like main weakness is the driver. And so makes a lot of sense from a profile standpoint to think that Homa can kind of bounce back. I know that he'd love to shake off uh, a bad performance at another major, but uh I think that the outright numbers at uh, 29, a little bit shorter than I'd like to see, uh, but plus 360 to top 10. Very nice for me. Uh, this, And then I got two top 20s, both at plus 450. Very similar profiles uh, with Andrew Putnam and Brendan Todd. Both more coarse fit plays. Uh, they're awful off the tee generally, which is fine because they're accurate. They're just not long. Uh, they got top 10 combined short game, which for me is your strokes in around the green and your strokes in putting combined over the past 50 rounds, according to data golf, they got kind of like mid-level iron. So that's fine. A lot of guys are going to miss these small greens anyway. So it's going to be about hitting fairways, hitting greens whenever you can. And whenever you don't saving par, which you do through having, you know, those good wedges uh, and, and the good putter. So uh, putting them course form, pretty bad but the form better is is good so i'm not like worried about that todd was 26 here last year all we're asking for is top 20 so i think those mm -hmm. are good numbers and my model agrees with that at plus 450 yeah and if putman putnam doesn't have the course form i think the plus 450 is a forgiving enough number where that's accounted for i think that that makes him pretty enticing so the finishing numbers brandon likes uh max homa plus 360 top 10 andrew putnam and brandon todd top 20 both at plus 450 that is all the time that we have here for today on covering the spread, breaking down the NBA play in games and the RBC heritage. Brandon, I want to thank you once again for swinging by for today. Have fun watching the play in games for tonight. Uh, good luck to you uh, with RBC heritage as well. And we'll talk to you once again next week. Yep. Yeah, good luck, everyone. Uh, enjoy it. And we'll see you next week.
and hopefully we can go back to back with another winner as with rom last week find brandon on twitter at kadula 13 find all of his pga sims over at numberfire.com i am on twitter at jim sonnes j-i-m-s-a-n-n-e-s you can also follow the fanduel podcast network at fanduel podcast back with dr ed fang once again tomorrow talking about nba uh turn or the nba playoffs and some nfl draft as well this has been covering the spread right here on the fanduel podcast network 